Welcome everyone to the third of this year's Burlington House Lunchtime Scientist Talks. I work at the Royal Astronomical Society. Well, I should, uh, I should probably say hello. I am Lucinda Offer, Education Outreach Officer for the Royal Astronomical Society. I work, uh, I work there and inc we encourage the study of astronomy, solar system science, geophysics, and closely related branches of science. Hi everyone, my name is Joe, Joe Burton. I'm from the Linnaean Society and the Education Manager there. And the Linnaean Society is all about nature and natural history and looking to inform, involve and inspire people to engage with nature and understand its significance through our collections, our programs uh, of activities like this one and also our scientific publications. The Royal Astronomical Society and the Linnaean Society both live in Burlington House a great big building in the center of London, alongside other cultural organizations such as the Royal Academy of Art, the Royal Society of Chemistry, the Geological Society, and the Society of Antiquaries. Uh, we're also called the RAS, and both us and the Linnaean have co-produced this series for young people with an interest in astrobiology to learn about this exciting field and the variety of careers that people can have. This talk is taking place on Zoom, so you might be joining us on Zoom webinar. And it's also live streaming onto YouTube, and you might be watching it onto, on a different social platform as well. If you are watching this live, hey, hi, uh, you can type questions directly into the Q&A boxes or the chat boxes or wherever, and we'll try and pick those up. And our speaker will try and answer them at the end. However, if you're not watching it live, and you're watching it later, you can still add comments, and uh, we'd love to read them. Our speaker today is Dr. Rosa Santo Martino, who is a researcher in space microbiology and microbial, micro, microbial, microbial, uh, microbial astrobiology at the University of Edinburgh. Rosa's main interests are in the effects of space conditions on microbial behavior and in harnessing the power of microbes for the development of sustainable biotechnologies for space exploration. Rose is here today to talk about space microbiology. So thank you very much for join, joining us, Rosa. We'll hand over to you now for your talk. Thank you. Thank you so much for this nice introduction and also for having me here. This is honestly um, one, like giving talks and talking especially to young people is one of the of my favorite things in, uh, in my job. So I'm really, really excited of being here. And I hope I, you could, will enjoy my talk about uh, space microbiology. And um, what is space microbiology? Well, you, you will see, hopefully it will become clearer when at the end of the talk. But however, um, as you can imagine, this is basically the study of microbiology applied to space and space exploration more uh, in particular. So uh, what are we going to talk about today? First, I'm going to explain what is a microorganism or microbe, because I'm not sure if everyone uh, is um, familiar with this term. Then we are going to see um, which are the, the roles that microorganisms perform for us on Earth, and also we, we will see beyond Earth. Which are the conditions in space that are relevant from the biological perspective? And then we will see why and how we could study microorganism in a, in a space environment. I will give you some examples of some milestones experiments that have been uh, performed in the field. And I'm also going to talk about the two space microbiology experiments that I was lucky enough to uh, work on uh, in my current position, which are called BioRock and BioAsteroid. And then something very briefly about how did I get to do what I do. So first things first, what is a microorganism? Um, this is a graphic representation of uh, what we biologists call the tree of life. It is basically, as you can see, a classification, a representation that allows the, um, the classification of organisms um, the, by different um, characteristics. This is, of course, just a graphic uh, funny representation. But when we talk about microorganisms, we are referring to microorganisms that uh, to organisms that are in this branch, which is bacteria or archaea. They can be protists. They can be um, unicellular fungi. 
or to get a little bit, a little bit more into details, they can be um, unicellular algae, they can be archaea, they can be bacteria, which you may be uh, more familiar with. They can be, again, unicellular fungi or um, filamentous fungi that are basically uh, moles, then viruses, and also some protozoan. So as you can see, they are all quite diverse. The name microorganism, uh, microorganisms come to the fact that the micro means very, very small. They are in the orders of micron, which is 0.001 millimeters or 0.000001 meters. So very tiny microorganisms. You can see they are quite diverse, but there are some characteristics in common. Like for instance, the fact that they are all made of a single cell they are called single cell organisms or also unicellular organisms, sometimes even less because viruses are not cells. And there is another characteristic in common, and it's that they have been found everywhere on Earth's biosphere. Everywhere we, we, we search for them, basically we found them. And when I mean everywhere, I literally mean everywhere. Like for instance, they have been found on soil, of course, and they are quite important for the formation of fertile soil, so basically for agricultural um, applications. But they are also famous to uh, be found in every type of surface, like uh, also in structure. In uh, You can see this is a pipe in which <laughs> you can see this is not very nice. And you will see why this is relevant also from the point of view of uh, space, because they can sometimes create um, corrosions, which is not the desirable. And then they have also been found in uh, conditions that we will consider extremes extreme, like for instance, very hot or very cold environment, very dry environment, so uh, in which the concentration of water is very low and uh, mm, water is important, actually necessary for life as we know it. They have also been found on very salty environments. They have been found on clouds and also, uh, last but not least, on uh, plants and even animals, included our own body. Um, I want to mention these in particular because not only they are present on and inside our body, but they are absolutely necessary for our health. And I want to stress this because when we think about microorganisms, we sometimes think actually quite often things about something that is nasty and dangerous. And I mean, we are in a pandemic, so of course we, uh, this is understandable, but most of the time microorganisms are actually quite necessary for our own survival, for our happy life on earth. And just to convince you about that, I just want to mention a few of the possible roles that microorganisms, um, actually not the possible, the roles that microorganisms perform for us on Earth, which are, for instance, um, they are quite important in the food industry. They are important for the presence of oxygen in our atmosphere. And actually, um, the concentration of oxygen that we, that we currently have in our atmosphere that allows us to breathe um, was created by microorganisms 2.3 billion years ago. So without them, we wouldn't breathe, basically. Then they are also important in a lot of industries, bio industries, like for instance, for the production of what is called biofuel and also for the production of some specific um, structures like um, biocomposite or biopolymers. They are also important in pharmaceutical industry. So not only for our health, for our, to have a healthy body, but, just, but also because they uh, produce a large part of um, drugs. Also from an environmental point of view, they are quite important from, for the recycling of waste. And again, they are also important for a process called bioremediation, which is basically a method by which they use microbes to um, uh, degrade pollutants from uh, some environments. They are also important, we already mentioned that, for um, agricultural application because they are important for the uh, soil for, for, for the production of fertile soil. And last but not least, they are also necessary for some uh, other application, like uh, just to mention one um, that I will focus more in, uh, in some minutes, biomining. So considering how important they are for us now on Earth, imagine how necessary they will become beyond Earth. So on an extraterrestrial environment. And some of the possible roles that they could perform for us beyond Earth include, for instance, the generation of oxygen. We saw how important they are, uh, they were on early Earth, so they will be quite important on an extraterrestrial planet. 
in the production of fertile soils starting from extraterrestrial rock and regoliths. And this is strictly correlated to the fact that we could, this could be useful to generate food and also for the recycling of waste. So when we think about an, a space environment, uh, either a spacecraft, a space station, but also an extraterrestrial settlement somewhere on the moon or Mars or whatever, we need to take into account that recycling is going to be extremely important because the resources are going to be limited. So uh, you may be aware of the fact that, for instance, already today on the International Space Station, they need to recycle water constantly because it's such a precious uh, resource. So recycling in space is going to be extremely important. And last but not least, also in space bioindustries. So all these possible roles that microorganisms could perform for us uh, have all the final aim to um, help us in uh, creating these self-sustaining life support systems and also uh, for the concept of in-situ resource utilization. So this is a concept uh, that aims to uh, utilize the resources in the place in which we are going to settle rather than uh, relying on a constant resupply from Earth because as you can imagine, the farthest we will go from Earth, the less it is going to be viable also in terms of costs to take resources from Earth and, and bring it to the extraterrestrial um, settlement. However, we mentioned that microorganisms are very good, uh, at least some of them are very good to, um, to thrive and survive uh, to harsh environment. But which, which, what is the harshest environment? Well, I may have a bias, but I think that the harshest environment is space. And let's see why is that. Um, which are the conditions that made space, the next space, quite a very um, nasty environment to live? And for, before mentioning this, I want to say that at the beginning, I will focus on the conditions that are present in open space or in, uh, in space in general. So I will mention quite a lot this term, which is LEO or low Earth orbit, which is basically the um, orbit in which um, the majority of spacecraft, like the shuttle, the International Space Station or the Mir Station orbits, because a lot of experiments as particularly space microbiology experiment have been performed in LEO. So this is just to mention that, keep this, this, term, this acronym in mind. So let's see which are the conditions in space. First, we have vacuum. Uh, vacuum is the condition of absence of matter or extreme low pressure. And um, when a, micro, uh, a biological organism is uh, uh, subjected to, to vacuum, there are two main uh, problems. The first, it it's the desiccation because uh, the water will evaporate from the body or from the cell surface. So uh, will go away. And so um, a biological organism will, uh, will uh, be subjected to desiccation. And another one is asphyxiation, of course, because of the absence of oxygen. So uh, you may be <laughs> familiar with images from sci-fi movies, et cetera, in which eyes of astronauts explode when they lose the helmet. This is not going to happen, but still you will die in a matter of seconds or minutes. So vacuum is really not something that you want to be exposed to for too long. And the other extreme that you have in space is uh, the extreme of temperatures. Um, when thinking about this sp deep space, the temperatures are really extreme. They can go to very close to the absolute zero to 10 billion K, so really, really um, extreme temperatures. When we think about um, a spacecraft orbiting in LEO, however, the temperature actually depends on the position in respect to the sun. So if it's closer to the sun, then um, temperature goes to up to 121 Celsius degrees, while if you go farthest from the sun, like here, you go to very low temperatures, which is uh, around min uh, 100 and, uh, minus 157 Celsius degrees, which is not as extreme as deep space, but still quite not um, enjoyable. Another uh, condition that is present in space, of course, is the high dose of radiation, of different type of radiations. So on Earth, we are quite protected from some of these radiations because of the atmosphere is, and because of the magnetic field of Earth that protect us quite a lot. But when we go um, in space, in open space, uh, or also in LEO, we experience a higher variety of these um, of these radiations. And this is very bad from the biological perspective because it can damage molecules and create either um, mutations or also death. 
And the last one is the, the difference in gravity conditions. So on Earth, we have a gravity acceleration uh, of 9.81 meters on uh, second squares, which is also referred to as 1G. Um, in space, we have a condition which is called microgravity. And particularly when we think about an object that is orbiting in uh, Leo, the gravity is not removed. Actually, gravity at that altitude is around 90% uh, of the altitude uh, of the gravity on Earth's surfaces. But you, um, when you see the object or the astronaut floating around the International Space Station, this is due to the fact that the spacecraft orbits around the Earth. And this creates um, a state of constant induced free fall around Earth. This is a condition that is called microgravity. Microgravity basically is 10 to the power of minus two G. So it is very, or even lower. So it is very, very low gravity, but still is not removed. And actually I want to say this because I want to point this because when they say zero gravity or absence of gravity, this is not really accurate. Microgravity or weightlessness, it's more accurate as a term. Now, when we uh, talk about the majority of experiments that I'm going to mention uh, later are experiments that have been performed inside the, um, a spacecraft or inside the space, a space station and so on. In this condition, um, the, the limited number of conditions are present because uh, uh, of course the atmosphere, the pressure inside the spacecraft is, co is controlled as well as temperatures. So in this condition, you uh, only experience uh, um, some, some radiation, some range of radiation, and also microgravity. However, if you think about other conditions in space, like for instance, a planetary body that can be, for instance, the moon or Mars or others, um, the condition still changes in respect to open space because the vacuum, for instance, depends on the atmosphere of the planet. In both moon and Mars, um, in, on the moon, actually, the atmosphere is quite negligible, so uh, it's not vacuum, but very close to. On Mars, the atmosphere is present, but again, it's very, the pressure is very, very low. So no vacuum, but still um, not really a nice pressure. Then there are still extremes of temperatures, a higher dose of radiation. The gravity is not microgravity, but it's still lower than Earth. It is 0.16 G for Moon and 0.38 G for uh, Mars. And also when we think about rocky planets, we also have to take into account other conditions, like for, for instance, the composition of the rock and regolith that can be uh, toxic and contains toxic compounds. Now, why do we want to study microorganisms in a space condition, in the space environment? Uh, I think we can split this question in two. First, why do we want to study microorganisms and then link this to why do we want to do this in space? Well, we've seen that microorganisms are quite interesting because some of them can survive to the harshest environment and we have seen how harsh the conditions are in, uh, in space. It is, they are also quite important for human health and for bioindustries as well as uh, to create an habitable environment. So this is strictly related to the fact uh, that that's quite necessary for uh, human space exploration. And last but not least also uh, because of the seek of knowledge, just because it's interesting. But there is another reason that is a very important one. And it's that if you remember, I told you microorganisms are everywhere, included our own body. So it doesn't matter wherever we will go in space, we are going to bring our microbes with us. So uh, there is no way that we can avoid that. And actually, I don't, we should not avoid that because, as I say, they are important for our health. So it is important to understand how they behave in a space environment. OK, so we decided that we want to study microorganisms in space. Um, how can we do that? There are several methods to do that. We can either use uh, theoretical and computational models, so just simulate um, on a computer the conditions and see how a microbe could react to that. We can use simulations, like for instance, simulation of microgravity or simulation of uh, um, extraterrestrial conditions. We can use what is called high altitude balloons, which are, as the name says, just um, a certain, uh, balloons that goes very high in the atmosphere, um, but they go in a space in the atmosphere, which is called near space, but as the name suggests, is not space yet. However, as you can see from this image, it's quite high. Or we can actually go to space. And here it comes again, the concept of uh, low or orbit or LEO, because uh, um, the majority of the experiment that 
actually all the experiments that we did so far in real space, uh, no, I would say maybe the majority of them, have been performed in, uh, in, uh, in LEO, either on a space shuttle on the International Space Station with it the station which is currently active or in the former Russian Mir station. So let's go and see some examples. So I want to show you some of the of the milestone experiments. I just selected a couple of them because uh, I know there is a lot of, of, um, of things that I'm telling you. So just a couple of two or three of them that um, in my opinion are quite milestones in, in space microbiology. For instance, this one was performed in the 90s on a shuttle mission and um, 1996 more specifically. And basically with this experiment, um, what did they do? They have taken one bacteria called, uh, bacterium called Bacillus subtilis, which is quite widely used in this type of experiment because it's, a, it's resistant to a lot of um, space conditions. And they um, exposed this microorganism to the solar radiation on board the space shuttle, but um, through a filter, an optical filter of different thickness. So this filter had the aim to simulate different ozone layer thickness. With this experiment, they had two main results. The first is um, the demonstration the, the, of, so basically um, they could predict um, the sensitivity of life to shrinking or enlarging ozone layer. And so it also gave clues on how important the ozone layer is for, for life on Earth. But also it allows us to understand what happens in early biosphere in which um, the ozone layer was not present yet. Another experiment which is uh, quite a milestone in my opinion is this one that was um, uh, performed in 2006 on another space shuttle mission. In this one, uh, this one was quite um, relevant because it was the first time that they demonstrated that uh, some bacterial pathogens um, shows an increased virulence after the space flight. So this is something that is quite recognized now. We know that when we have uh, a pathogen in space, it is going to be more aggressive in terms of viral, uh, virulence. And this is quite relevant because we also know that astronauts tend to have an impaired immune system. So if you put the two things together, it is quite important, again, why to study, um, how and why to study um, microorganisms behavior in space. Um, moreover, this experiment here posed, posed for the first time the basis to conduct research to use space flight to um, develop vaccine and antibiotics. So, for, so basically for, um, for bio industries, for space bio industries. Another experiment, um, which is actually it's it's um, similar experiments are always ongoing um, on uh, on the space station in order to take to to check which is the microbial um, contamination, microbial condition in, uh, in the space station. But this is one of the most recent ones that have been published. It was performed in two thousand and nineteen. So as I told you before, the a spacecraft, the space station is necessarily a closed environment, right? Because, um, because it's, uh, it's important to, to keep everything safe in that condition. Um, the space station has been active in 25 years now, so it's quite a long time. It actually is about to retire. And um, when a spacecraft or any, actually any space, um, space technology is sent to space, they, have been, they are normally cleaned very carefully and sterilized as much as possible. So when they arrive to space, they are almost, they, they are very, very clean and sterile. However, astronauts with their, with their microbial community start visiting them. And uh, what they discover, uh, what they did was that they collected samples from eight different places on the International Space Station. They analyzed the microbial community of these eight, sam uh, eight um, places, and they discovered that uh, the um, composition of the microbial community on the International Space Station resemble quite a lot uh, those of the those present on animal skin. Uh, animal animal skin. Sorry. This is quite obvious if you think about the fact that the, the International Space Station has been clean and sterilized before the launch, before the assembling, and then it has been inhabited by, uh, by humans. And so it is quite normal that what 
what contaminates the International Space Station is, uh, um, is uh, strictly related to our own uh, microbial community. However, um, this also needs to be taken into strict control because the International Space Station is also showing some uh, damages and, cor and, and corrosion due to mold and bacteria. Also, some of the uh, organisms that have been found are uh, opportunistic pathogens. So if you think about what I told you before about the increased virulence in space, this is something that needs to be taken really um, into account for the future. Now, I mentioned before um, the, some of the possible roles that microorganisms perform on Earth and they could perform beyond Earth. I now want to uh, shortly talk about the experiment that I was involved, the space microbiology experiment that I was in, involved in. And um, so I have to explain to you a little bit about this application here, which is biomining, because it is strictly related to what I've done so far. So what is biomining? Biomining, also referred to as bioleaching, and is the process of using microorganisms to extract metals of economic interest from rock ores, uh, mine waste, and so on. And need, it, the same sim, similar mechanism is also used for bioremediation, uh, which is another application that I mentioned before. So on Earth, biomining is currently used to extract around 20, 25% of uh, um, copper, around 5% of, of gold, but also other metals such as uh, uranium, cobalt, and, and elements such as uh, um, rare earth elements, and so on. So um, why using biomining? Why biomining has some advantages in respect to traditional mining. First of all, it can be used as complementary uh, technology because it helps improve in the rates of metal recovery from mine waste and dumps. But it is also more economic and it's also more environmental friendly in general. It's been, there is uh, an increasing interest in the concept of uh, space biomining, so uh, biomining rocks in space. Uh, why is that? Well, um, the reason is uh, what I told you before, the fact that when we are going to move to space or to settle in space, we need to recycle as much as possible and we need to uh, use to, to do the ISRU, in situ research utilization as much as possible. So from this point of view, space biomining is quite interesting. And um, this is what the, um, this is a beautiful NASA image uh, that shows um, the future project, the future aims of the majority of space agencies. So now we are, um, all our work in space is uh, uh, happening basically around the International Space Station, if you don't think about rovers um, and so on. But later we want to move first on the moon and then uh, use this as a base to go to Mars. So these are the objectives. So when we think about space biomining, the um, planetary bodies that we are interested in in uh, biomining are the Moon, uh, Mars, and also asteroids, because asteroids contain a lot of precious uh, elements, like, for instance, a lot of platinum and nickel. However, uh, we've seen that the conditions that are present in space and also planetary bodies are quite different from those on Earth. So before understanding, and one of these, for instance, is the gravity condition. The gravity condition is quite different. Uh, on the moon, we have a lower condition. On Mars gravity, we have a lower condition in respect to terrestrial gravity. And also on asteroid, we have something that is approximately uh, microgravity. So before understanding if we can do biomining in space, we first need to understand how does gravity influence the interaction of the microbes with the rock uh, surface. And this is how the, we decided to perform this um, experiment, which is the first biomining experiment performed on board a space station called BioRock. Uh, this was performed in 2019 on board the space station, but it was first um, first uh, proposed by uh, my supervisor, Professor Kokel from the University of Edinburgh in 2008. So it took 11 years to become um, a reality. And uh, a lot of different people and groups were involved. This is an ESA supported and uh, STFC funded um, project, but a lot of um, excellent groups were involved and uh, this work wouldn't have been possible without um, these excellent teams. 
Now I want to show you this brief video because it explains very well the rationale behind uh, the experiment. This was pre prepared by NASA in preparation for the experiment. So you will see that they talk with the future tense because of that. But uh, nevertheless, it explains quite well what we try to, to do. And uh, this is why I, I, I will just show you. The International Space Station will soon host some of the smallest miners Sorry. <laughs> in the universe, microbes. Microbes growing on the surface of rocks can gradually break them down and extract useful minerals and metals. This is a process called biomining. As we explore space, we are seeking to use biomining to turn rock and regolith into soil for growing plants and food. But before we can use this technique in planetary settlements, we first need to test it in space. On the space station, bioreactors will be placed inside a centrifuge where microbes will grow on rocks in microgravity and simulated Martian gravity. Investigators will examine how three types of microbes behave within pieces of basalt and evaluate how well the different microbes extract elements from the rocks. The findings will be compared to ground-based results. We hope to gain insights into how microbes interact with rocks in microgravity and how we might use them in our exploration of deep space. All right. The oh, internet. Not again. Okay. So just, uh, I think it explained quite well, but uh, let's get a little bit more into details, although I, I will try to be mm, not too detailed. <laughs> So first of all, we needed to select the right microorganism for the experiment. They needed to have some characteristics in common. Uh, one of these is that it needed to be safe for the crew, of course. And eventually we decided to, uh, we selected these three microorganisms, three bacterial species. Um, one is Sphingomonas disticabilis, which was provided by our group here in Edinburgh. The second one was Bacillus subtilis, which I mentioned before, if you remember, and this was provided by the German Aerospace Center. And another one was Copriavidus medallidurans, um, provided by SEK Center in Belgium. As the rock substrate to be biomined, we selected basalt for two main reasons. The first it is, uh, is that it's quite porous material, which provided a good support for the colonization of the microbes. And the second one is that it's a good analog for moon and Martian rocks. So we cut um, the basal specimen into these uh, little basal slide. And we inoculated the single bacterial culture on each one of them. We also had uh, what we call negative control or non-biological control, which was basically just sterile basal slide without any bacterial inoculation. We have put them into the hardware called Biomining Reactor, which was specifically designed uh, by Kaiser Italia for uh, this experiment. And then th this is just a set of uh, the hardware ready for the launch. And then we, <laughs> we assembled them in, um, in NASA Kennedy in Florida. Uh, this is, uh, well, me, and this is uh, Professor Coquel, and this is Anemic Wack, and this is part of the BioRock team. And this is just to show you some funny images of us at NASA being very excited because we were preparing this experiment there. And this is the day of the launch. The experiment was launched in, uh, on the International Space Station in July 2019 uh, by the SpaceX Commercial Resupply Service 18. You can see here the astronaut Luca Barmitano installing the hardware on board the International Space Station. And then this is us after the experiment, uh, very happy because everything went okay and we retrieved, uh, successfully retrieved uh, the samples. And this is me analyzing the samples at the Stanford in the US. Now, uh, what did we do with this experiment? Basically, we prepared four different sets of samples and we launched three of them in space, which were subjected to microgravity, simulated Martian gravity, or 
stimulated terrestrial gravity. And also we had another set of sample which was just subjected to ground, uh, um, we call it ground control. And uh, this was subjected to real terrestrial gravity. Bacteria grew on the International Space Station for 21 days. And when they came back, we analyzed the results. So which are these results? What did we discover? The first thing that we discover is that uh, there was no difference in uh, uh, the final cell concentration of the bacterial species um, between the space samples after the 21 days. What does this mean? So because of how the experiment was performed, we don't know what happens during the 21 days. We only had data after the 21st day, so when the experiment was already finished. So we don't know what happens during the 21 days, but we know what happens after three weeks. And the fact that they all reach the same gravity, the same final um, cell concentration, regardless of the gravity condition, is a very good result from the point of view of biotechnological application, because it means that gravity would not, um, will not negatively affect biotechnological applications. Regarding biomining, we focus on two different type of uh, um, elements, which were rare earth elements, which are a class of metals and uh, elements in general, which are, have an enormous impact in our, on our, our, our everyday life because they are used in all electronic devices that we know. So imagine in space how important they will be. And another one is vanadium, which, is, which has a strong industrial interest because it is basically uh, used to um, enhance the hardness of uh, structural materials. Where can we find these elements? We can find them basically in all the planetary bodies that I uh, mentioned before, including, of course, Earth. And uh, what did we discover? We discovered that one of the three bacteria species, which is Sphingomonasis cicablis, was able to uh, extract a rare earth elements in all the gravity conditions that we tested. And two bacterial species, Sphingomonasis cicablis and Bacillus subtilis, were able to extract um, vanadium on, in all the gravity conditions that we tested. This is an excellent news because it means that space biomining is in principle achievable under a range of uh, different gravity conditions. And so to summarize what we discover from BioRock, we discover first that low gravity is hopefully not going to be a limitation for space biotechnological applications. And second, we demonstrated for the first time biomining on a space station. Now, following the success of BioRock, we are now performing a second uh, uh, similar experiment called BioAsteroid. This time it is going to be, it is actually being very similar to BioRock, but um, there are some differences. Like for instance, this time, instead of using basalts, uh, terrestrial rock, we are going to use real um, asteroidal material. And we are going to use both bacterial species, uh, the one that we use already for, for BioRock, and also fungus and a combination of the two. So we are going to enhance our knowledge on microbial um, capacity to biomine in space. The experiment, the space experiment has been already performed uh, on board the International Space Station. We are now performing uh, the, um, the ground control. So I hope that I can give you uh, data on this uh, quite, quite soon. And I would just want to say something at the end um, that maybe why do we want to, to, to do space exploration? Why does it matter to do space exploration? First of all, we have seen that it is likely going to be the future of humanity because all the space agencies are interested now in, in expand our presence in space. Second, because it's very interesting. And third, because the, um, the technologies that we develop for space exploration, for the scientific and technological advantages, advantages uh, historically gives us here on Earth a lot of uh, benefit. They benefit a lot of terrestrial application. And here are some examples. For instance, some, um, some uh, biomedical application, GPS, um, environmental issues, and weather forecast, but also for public outreach. There is a, a topic that I'm really interested in now, and it's uh, how to keep space exploration sustainable. So in the future, what I would like to do is to, uh, to address this issue. So how can we keep it uh, as much sustainable as we can? And we've seen that not only this is going to be um, an ethical issue, but it's also going to be necessary because we've seen how important it is to recycling in space. 
So what I'm going to focus in the future is to try and understand how we can use uh, some tools of biology like biotechnology, synthetic biology, geome microbiology, etc., to keep space exploration sustainable. And I hope this is going to benefit not only space applications, but also terrestrial applications. So the scientific part is conclude, uh, concluded. I just wanted to briefly tell you how did I get to do what I do, because uh, I, hope, I hope this may be of interest for some of you. I don't want to bore you too much of <laughs> telling you my story, but I hope that can be kind of useful for those of you that are interested in, in um, this kind of, of um, future career. So as, when I was a child, I was always passionate and curious about, about science. A lot of children are quite um, curious about uh, why um, things are as they are and so on. However, there was an episode when I was eight years old that really changed, that, that changed my, my life, I will say, because a teacher uh, in uh, my class organized an event with an astronomer. So this astronomer came to the class and he, I remember there was like three encounters and the first one he built like a planetary in our classroom and another occasion, uh, it was in during the evening and they built, they, they, he brought some telescopes and we could, we were able to see for the first time the moon, Jupiter, Saturn and so on. So basically that, that was it for me. I decided that I want to become an astronaut. So not, not a biologist, not an astro astronomer, but an astronaut. So very ambitious. I'm just mentioning this because I think this highlights how important public engagement is. And I hope this could maybe inspire some teachers to do something similar. Also, I had another inspiration. So when I, um, when I was a child in, my, in the same building in which I was living, an astronaut was living. So I will imagine I wanted to become an astronaut and I had an astronaut living in my building. I was extremely excited. Uh, this astronaut is uh, uh, Umberto Guidoni and he was the first uh, European astronaut uh, on board the International Space Station. And he, he actually um, also collaborated to, to, the, to the building of the International Space Station. However, I was always too shy to approach him, which is something that I really regret, but you know, I was a child. Then later on in high school, I got really, in, of course, I was always interested in space science and astronomy and so on, but I got more interested into biology. So when I, when I came to decide which, were, which what I wanted to do at university, I picked uh, biotechnology. But still, I did something that was completely different from what I do now. It was still related to microbiology, but definitely different from space microbiology. For instance, during my bachelor, I worked on um, the fecal microbiome, the fecal composition, uh, microbial composition of iguanas, so completely uh, different. When I started, when I, during my master, I still worked on microorganisms, but I changed the type of microorganism because it was not anymore bacteria, but yeasts, which are uh, fungi. Then, and I worked on molecular biology and the uh, molecular bi um, basis of cell cycles. Then during my PhD, I moved, I was still working on yeast, so still microbiology, but I was working on how the molecular, um, molecular reactions to uh, lack of oxygen. So I was getting closer to the, to, you know, the topic of, I, uh, of uh, harsh conditions, but still quite different. How did I get to do space microbiology? Well, as happens to a lot of PhD students, when I was about to finish my PhD, I got a little crisis in which I was trying to understand what I wanted to do in the future, uh, what do, which is the thing that passionate that I'm more passionate about, etc. And when I was decided what I wanted to do, I went to this event organized by uh, the university uh, in which I was doing my PhD, which is the Sapienza University of Rome. In this event, I met this guy again. Maybe you may recognize him. He's the, uh, the, astro the astronaut that was living in my building, not anymore at that time. And that really inspired me to, to get back to, 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 the, to explore again my love for space. I was already aware of the existence of astrobiology, but I didn't, thought, I didn't think it was an opportunity to me because I thought it was too late. I was too far from what I was doing. But then after this, this um, 
this episode, this event, I decided to give it a chance. And I started digging around. I discovered the work of my current supervisor, which is Professor Kokel here at the University of Edinburgh. I get really fascinated by his work. And I also discovered that there was an open position for a microbiologist in his lab. So I thought, okay, that's it. I, I have to apply. I will never get it, but I still, I have to try. And what happens is that I got the position and this is basically how I got uh, involved in the space microbiology. So I, I will conclude now because I'm, I'm conscious of time. Uh, I hope, see, these are just some, some uh, links that I hope may be useful for you. And of course, feel free to contact me. But if I can, uh, I, if, I hope that I gave you at least two take home messages. The first is that space microbiology is very cool. And the second is that uh, if you want to pursue a career, never think that it's too late, particularly in astrobiology, because astrobiology is such um, an interdisciplinary um, topic that it needs a lot, a lot of expertise in different fields, both scientific and not scientific. So really, if you are interested in that, just, just try and, and go on with that. So with this, I thank you for your attention and I will be very happy to take all your questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Santo Martino. That was fantastic. I love the story <laughs> where he, he lived with you in your building, or he lived in your building anyway, and, uh, and then you, you, didn't, you didn't have the courage no. to, to, to contact him, but then here he comes again in your life, you know? Um, and, and that actually made a very pivotal uh, change in your life, really, just um, having uh, met him again. And, and what did he say? Did, he, did you tell him, I used, did, I used to live with you in the same building? Did you tell him that story? I really wanted to, but um, there was a lot of people that was trying to make pictures with him, take pictures with him, et cetera. So I didn't, but um, still I was really inspired by his talk in particular because he, um, see, uh, he's an astrophysicist, I think, or, well, he was an astrophysicist or a physicist. So he, um, of course he was involved in space uh, as well, but his talk was really, how did he get to, get to, to be an astronaut? And his story was, something like, um, I just, NASA opened this position. I thought, well, I will never make it, but let's try and apply. And then he was getting on and on in the, he was passing all the, the steps, you know, to get to that. And then uh, he saw, say something that uh, he never, he didn't say anything, not even to his wife. And then when he got to the stage in which he was really, they were like two candidates, he had to say to the wife and say, look, maybe I'm going to be an NASA. So it was really inspiring to me because I thought, yeah, I would try. I mean, it's not as ambitious as being an astronaut, but still, I thought I thought um, that was really, really inspiring to me, seeing how you, you have to try, because if you don't try, you don't know how it's going to be, basically. <laughs> Absolutely. That's what, when I do talks, uh, public talks, and especially just schools, that's kind of how I end my talks is just apply, you know? So it's it's our, you know, all in our head that we're never going to get or it can be possible, but it definitely isn't going to be possible if you don't at least apply. Yeah. So, you know, you'll never know if you don't apply. So absolutely go for it every time, everything that you're interested in. I love all your connections to just, you know, how you, how you got to where you're at. Um, just things that inspired you. And I appreciate that you mentioned your teachers who kind of go that extra mile because I absolutely agree with you as a, as a teacher myself, how important it is. I know it's hard being a teacher and especially in the United Kingdom, but to also have extra things for your students to experience and bring in new speakers and things like that. Hopefully that's easier with this technology and the life we're living here online to bring in speakers. And, and this was our effort today to bringing you in. So thank you so much for being with us and sharing your, um, your, your life so far, your incredible career so far. Thank um, you. <laughs> So well, I'm an early career, so it's still <laughs> very early. <laughs> well, such an exciting one at that. Joe, did you want to say something? Go ahead. Yeah, I mean, I've got a few questions here and we are short for time, so I'll, I'll, I'll plow on with them. I've got two questions about biomining that you were talking about. Um, one is, I'll, I'll read it out. It says, could Dinococcus radiodurans if you know of that, be mm -hmm. used for biomining as an organism that's already been shown to be extremely resilient in the Tampopo mission. So yeah, um, it is widely used. I mentioned Bacillus subsilis, which is this, uh, used in a lot of space microbiology experiments. Dinococcus radiodurans is another one because um, 
the name suggests, as the name suggests, is um, very resistant to a lot of um, harsh space condition, for instance, radio, um, radiations. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't know anything regarding it being used for, for biomining. And uh, I, I should dig into that, honestly. So I don't know if it... Uh, I think, so the majority of time when we think about um, biomining organisms, they need to be, um, to be collected by, uh, in a rock environment or in a metal polluted environment. So you are kind of sure that it can at least survive and probably mm -hmm. take metals to, um, as nutrients. With dinococcus, I've never, I never worked on this, so I'm not sure when, where it was isolated on uh, what is the, the, the physiology of it, but I will do that because that's, that's uh, <laughs> something that never popped into my head. So thanks for asking. <laughs> Yeah, there was a question about like a clarification, I guess, on the uh, space experiments. Were they subjected to uh, the corresponding moon and Mars atmospheres, or was it the space station atmosphere? Is it uh, it refers to to mine to to Biorock to mine? Yeah, I think it was to yours. Okay. Yeah. No, in that case, we only um, they were subjected. They were basically present into an incubator inside the space station in the same in the Columbus. Um, module, which is the, the module in which the majority of, of space experiments are performed. So it is in, uh, um, in uh, the normal atmosphere that, that, that the astronauts are subjected to. So the only thing that we tested was uh, gravity indeed. Right, of course. Uh, yeah, I personally just love how um, interdisciplinary astrobiology is and how biomining fits into that and you touched upon space sustainability as well which I think is just fantastic um, and biomining seems like it's a it could be a huge tool in like generating these metals organically over time uh, and how that could work with engineers as well have you ever worked with engineers or like it, are engineers exploring how to take those metals and do things with them yeah, so um, not well in, uh, yeah, so the astrobiology and particularly space microbiology experiment required a lot, a lot of engineering intelligence because, uh, well, intelligence, I don't know if intelligence is the correct word, but uh, in, uh, engineers are extremely important and it is important the collaboration between what a biologist wants and what is actually feasible. Um, we had this excellent team of uh, engineers, uh, which is um, Kaiser Italian in Italy. And uh, they helped us creating the hardware. So they are an excellent team that help us. Like we tell them, okay, we want to do that. And they try to fix everything that, that we want to do in an in, uh, in engineering context. From the point, so not, for instance, they created this little hardware that is a small biomining reactor. Um, but in general, in, at NASA particularly, but also uh, European Space Agency, um, a lot of engineering are working on this. And I am currently collaborating to create um, what is called a white paper but that is basically just a kind of um, paper in which you give recommendations to space agencies on what will be interesting to develop for, for a certain uh, applications. And, and the lead of this paper is an engineer. Is mm -hmm. called uh, Luis Dea. So yeah, uh, very a great researcher. Yeah, and so yeah, it absolutely necessary. It, without engineering, all of this it wouldn't be possible. So. Fantastic. I'll pass over to Lisa for some questions now. More comments. I do have a couple of more questions. Thank you, Joe. Um, also on careers as well. But let me get to a couple that came early in on your talk. Ashreen asks, why did a virus become more virulent um, in space? Uh, you talked about mutations and, and all that, but does microgravity trigger uh, violence? So um, I was mentioning, uh, the word that I mentioned is not on virus, is on uh, micro, uh, on bacteria actually. And also some, I think they've done also on, on some fungi, but they, they are not viruses. However, why are they um, more virulent? It is for, basically because of the fact that when they are in space, they see it as, they feel it as a, an harsh environment, uh, particularly some of them. So normally the pathogens are microorganisms which are used to, to, to live in an environment which is our body. So when you 
so like space is not really what they are happy to. It's not like Radiococcus, uh, um, sorry, Radiodurans or Bacillus, which thrives quite okay in space condition. They are not happy in that condition. So to them, that this is a stress, and they normally react. Uh, by um, by enhancing their virulence, also by creating thicker biofilms. So biofilms are microbial structures that bacteria forms on surfaces, and it is a structure. Um, basically, they create this kind of webs that contains the microbial cells, and inside these films, they are more protected to stresses. But my uh, biofilms are also linked to an increased virulence. Also, they need more, they have, they feel the microgravity, well, they indirectly feel microgravity, so they need more nutrients. So the short answer is that they feel it as a stress, and because of that, they take, uh, they need, um, they, they, they decide to, to be more virulent. <laughs> That makes actually a lot of sense. And I'm glad you made that distinction between, you know, since I asked you or I wondered about astrobiology, space mi microbiology, and the difference between that. But because this is a question about viruses, I guess, we are going to have a talk, a speaker on astrobiology too. I can't believe that there's all these different, you know, <laughs> disciplines within astrobiology that are connecting to it. So that's really great. Um, I did want to get to um, another question from YouTube. Um, Aaron asks, um, is there any anyone trying to look for non-carbon based life forms without DNA, RNA, or, or, um, or Earth itself? Hmm. So I, I'm not aware of any particular group. I know that this is like a discussion that is on, on astrobiology. Um, the general idea in astrobiology is that carbon based um, life is the most, uh, it's probably going to be the one. There are some ideas on um, silicon-based uh, lives, but honestly, from the chemical point of view, uh, carbon is basically the, 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 the most, um, the most uh, obvious one, the most probable one, actually. Um, but this doesn't mean that people is not studying that. There are computational models that are trying to study that. There are people that are, that are having this discussion. I'm sorry, it's not my, really my field of expertise, so I don't want to say something that is yeah, not that's true. Okay. <laughs> that's quite right. We might have had it actually answered in a previous talk, so maybe I'll look for that answer for them. But um, Joe, I'll pass it on to you. I do have a couple more questions on careers at the end, so um, go ahead. Yeah, absolutely. I think there's uh, lots of people are interested to talk to you about your career and how they can get into the career. I'm just going to do one final one um, on kind of the science, I guess. And this is about ethical concerns um, when we're going to Mars and or, or any planet, I guess, um, about the impact of bringing our microbes over to these places and how it might interfere with microbes that already exist there or fossilized um, microbes that are there and whether we might damage them and lose them when they mix with ours. Yeah. So is this a, a serious concern? Are we, are we doing well in preventing this from happening or do it, does it not matter? Yeah, so uh, this is a matter of planetary protection and we um, spoke before about the fact that the next talk is going to be specifically on planetary protection. So I will recommend um, attending that. But yeah, planetary protection is a real, something that absolutely needs to be taken into account is an ethical issue, but also a technical issue. We need to take it into account. And I think so the current um, planetary protection rules depends on the on the body the planetary body that we want to to that we are talking about for instance moon has lower um, protection with respect to mars this depends on different uh, reasons like for instance why you know the, the the possibility that scientists thinks that there is life in that planet so the possibility that we can actually contaminate something give problem to something um, that may live there moon is considered to be basically sterile so uh, it's not very protected but Mars is really really protected because from the astrobiological point of view is really interesting so uh, from this point of view it needs to be taken into account but it's also true that um, uh, if we so considering what she, what is the the future of space exploration the planetary protection um, laws needs to be 
updated time to time, depending on what we want to do, what space agencies want to do. But still, it's something that needs to absolutely be taken into, always into, uh, into context yeah, and into um, consideration. Should we move on to careers in the next few minutes? We'll, we'll, we'll roll over just um, because we do want to talk to you about careers. I'm really interested in the astronaut uh, who lived in your building and how that affected your career, obviously, in a, in a big way. Um, and do you think role models are important? Uh, are there enough role models in uh, astrobiology and in your field? I think, well, in my experience, they are really important because... I tend to be all, I think I'm, I'm learning over time to be uh, more self-confident, but, um, but it is an issue. So uh, the role models are important, not only to give you, uh, like to, to support you, but also to, to give you examples, like see if this person is, is doing that, I can do that too. If uh, uh, this person uh, is like inspiration and all these kind of things, I think it's really important. In astrobiology, I would say that, the majority of us, I cannot think about anyone which is unpleasant and not uh, wanting to, to, to share the, they are normally, we are normally quite passionate about sharing uh, our, what we do and uh, inspiring people. This is, I guess, also because of the fact that, again, this is a quite interdisciplinary field. And um, I, I would really encourage teachers and, and also scientists actually to engage with uh, younger people and the other way around, like if you want to send an email to someone that you think may be an inspiration for you, just do that because most of the time they will be very happy to answer. If they don't, it's just because they are busy, but not because they don't want to. <laughs> That's great advice. I'll pass that with Lucinda. Thanks, Joe. <laughs> a couple of, uh, you're definitely an inspiration, uh, Dr. Santamarina Martino. There's a, a, a couple of words here from Nicola on YouTube. She says the research you've been involved in is so interesting and she would love to pursue this area of science in the future. She's about to undergo her um, master's of science in microbiology. Mm -hmm. So hopefully um, <laughs> it will lead her to this field. She asked for any tips or advice, how to boost their chances of entering into this field as a new graduate. I also have a, another master's student who's in astro, uh, sorry, nanotechnology and is interested to dive into astrobiology. How, do, how would you, um, you know, advise them on how to get there? So I think the first step will be to like um, uh, Google, Google, really Google like the, the, the you can start from like uh, outreach, uh, like simpler articles that explains what, what microbiology is, sorry, what astrobiology is, so you, that you can understand what is actually what you will be more interested in. So is it more space microbiology or is it more the extreme conditions or is it um, the search for extraterrestrial life? It depends also on that. Uh, so you can try and understand what you're more interested in that. And then normally when you find these articles, uh, you also have some names of, of specific scientists that work on the specific area, and you can try just to, to contact them. Uh, you can contact them on Twitter, you can contact them by email. Um, yeah, just, just dig around and contact them, because as I said before, I think um, both the topic like nanotechnology and microbiology, they are excellent to get into, into the field from different perspectives. So... You, you can just try and understand what really interested you the most and try to get involved with, uh, with people that do that and get advices from them. Are you guys all on Twitter? Is, tw is Twitter the space where astrobiologists um, meet or is, there, is, that, is that the platform? I, I am on Twitter and I actually got on Twitter when I realized that in my field, Twitter is quite widely used. <laughs> so yeah, I would recommend Twitter. Um, I know that also Facebook is used, but I don't know. I'm sorry. I, I don't think like Instagram or TikTok is, is um, uh, to my knowledge, Twitter is the most used one by researcher in my field. <laughs> Yeah, we'll for that. now, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, thank you very much uh, for that talk. I, I felt quite inspired about listening to you, and I'm sure <laughs> and hope that everyone else has too. Um, so I'll just say, yeah, thank you one last time, Rosa, and 
next time we've got someone talking about planetary protection we're really excited about and this series is all available to watch again on youtube so um do register for next week and we've got more that we're announcing coming uh, in the future as well so thank you very much from me joe at the linnean society Yes, and thank you so much for me, Lucinda, at the RAS. And Joe's absolutely right. We're going to continue on next week uh, with uh, planetary protection, as he said. And we're going to be also rolling out some more talks in June, um, continuing on with astrovirology and others. So thank you all for being with us. Thank you, thank Dr. Sanson. It was a pleasure. Everyone, have a great day. And we'll see you next week.